Alrighty, so good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to the InfoChip Support Weekly Webinar. Um, today we're going to be covering IC Desktop and just kind of the basics of how to use that, creating single assets, uh, multiple identical assets, and performing operations. Uh, just a little bit about myself. My name is Matt Clarkson. I've been the technical support analyst here at InfoChip for four years now. Um, I'm your main contact whenever you reach out to support at InfoChip.com or call the office. Um, I'm the one that's there to help you out or answer any questions you have. Uh, I'm also the training expert. Uh, I've done on-site training uh, as well as uh, a multitude of uh, individual over the internet uh, screen share type trainings as well. So just a quick overview of what we're going to cover today. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about syncing our IC desktop program uh, and the importance of that. Uh, creating single assets and performing a proof test in that single asset create. Um, creating multiple identical assets and then performing an operation on an existing asset. So a, a research. Uh, so we're just going to jump right in here. So um, for those of you that are familiar, uh, this is kind of the IC desktop program here. Um, to get it installed, you do need administrator rights um, on the InfoChip website. What you'll do is log on uh, under the help section. You'll see downloads. Uh, that'll give you the instructions on how to download IC desktop, uh, as well as the most recent desktop version. Um, if you do run into any issues downloading desktop onto your computer, uh, please reach out to support at infochip.com. Uh, I've done it a thousand times on my own machine, so uh, I'm more than willing to help out. So uh, once you've got IC desktop installed and you've done your first sync, um, the sync with infochip server button is really important. So what that does is um, pulls down any information from the website um, that isn't currently located in the local database on IC desktop. So what that means is um, desktop works a little bit in an offline state. Um, so it's not always connected um, to the website. It's not constantly pulling down data and uploading data. Um, and that's only happening when you hit save and upload on a new asset create or when you hit the sync with InfoChip server button. Uh, when that happens, it'll sync back and forth between the website, uh, pulling down any data that has been recently added from other platforms or from the website directly, uh, as well as if you were working offline and uh, you have assets or operations that haven't been uploaded yet, uh, those will be uploaded through the sync as well. Um, so best rule of thumb thing that I always say is sync first thing in the morning and then sync right at the end of the day just to keep everything up to date uh, in case you were running into any data issues or internet issues. Uh, everything will get uploaded and then everything will be downloaded back to the machine so you're able to work with any of the assets you have in your system. From there, you're just going to log in. So just click on the login button, choose your username from the drop down, enter in your password. And then from there, we're going to go to assets. So the asset screen is kind of the main screen that you'll always be working off of. Um, there's kind of three ways to enter it, to start entering in it, uh, your first asset create. You can scan a chip. So if I tap this button, uh, it's going to open up waiting for chip scan here. You would then scan in your chip ID and it would populate up in the box at the top here. You can also key in a chip ID. So if you have a tag that has like the physical um, uh, chip ID number on it, you can always type that in. Uh, if you're using a reader that scans like a keyboard, which is most of the readers that we supply at InfoChip, um, you can also scan that into this field as well. Um, but if you were going to do that, you might as well just use the scan chip field. And then the last one is entering asset numbers. So uh, for this, this is if you're not using RFID, uh, and you're just going to track the uh, asset number and serial number, you're just going to enter it in up at the top here. So I'm just going to call this uh, web-1 as our first asset we're going to create. So you type your asset number, which is your visible identifier on your piece of equipment, and then you're going to click create new asset on the right hand side.
that's going to open up your single asset create screen. So now we can see we've got our visible asset number up here. It'll automatically copy that into the serial number field. Obviously, we can go in and change this if we need to. So we could call this webinar dash one if we needed to. Um, but we're just going to stick with web dash one for today. And the next thing you're going to do is choose your asset category. So you click on the field or click on the little arrow off to the right there. And that's going to load our little uh, pop up here with our asset categories that we have access to. So from here, what I can do is I can kind of go through the drop downs here. Uh, and today we're just going to create a single leg chain sling. So if I go down, go under sling, chain sling, choose my single leg chain sling. What it's going to do is it's going to pop up the operations that we want to perform on this piece of equipment. So from here, uh, because we are going to be performing a proof test, what we want to do is select this IC test bench proof test form and then hit continue. It's very important that you select the IC test bench proof test form when you are per, uh, performing a proof test because there are system tasks that are in there that the um, uh, desktop module will actually autofill for you. Uh, things like peak load and target load hold time, all of those will be um, available to you right away. Uh, and they'll get autofilled once you're done performing your test. So from here, um, the next thing you're going to do is choose your asset from a prefill. So what we can do is we can just click the drop down and it's going to give us access to all the prefills we currently have for that single leg chain sling category. Um, if you don't have any prefills, I highly recommend going in and uh, creating some. We will be doing a webinar on prefills in the uh, near future. Um, but basically what this does is just by description, um, you select the prefill that you want to use and that's going to automatically fill out uh, most of the information down your right hand side about that piece of equipment. So if we take a look, um, we've got like our model, our finish, top fitting, um, our capacities are entered in there, bottom fittings, master link size, all of that information is auto filled in there. Um, things like length that will always be kind of uh, a variable, you can enter in afterwards. So we're just going to say this is 10 feet, for example. And then what you can do is that's going to automatically fill your asset description as well. So what we can do is we can go up here, we can fill in, you know, so it's one and a quarter by 10 foot SSG alloy chain sling. And if we need to change any of the information as well, we can also do that. So if I needed to change this to an SGG and change this to a grab hook, I can do that as well. I can change the information from the prefill. And I can also enter in new things like manufacturer. So once you've got your asset attributes all in there, you're going to choose the customer you want to assign this asset to. Um, you can also select if you want to add it to my inventory. Basically what this is, is your my inventory is things that are tracked internally. Um, so if you're creating a, a chain sling that you're going to be using um, in your own shop or uh, a hose that you're using in your own shop tracking internally, uh, that's where you would use the my inventory option. Um, but for today, we're just going to choose a customer. So we pick our drop down. We're going to pick my always favorite Matt Clarkson Corp. We're going to say this is going to Matt's desk. It's a big chain sling for my desk. So what you're going to see here is that um, after you choose your customer, it's going to load your locations. So it'll show your location tree here. Um, you can add new customers and new locations through the desktop uh, program. I always kind of recommend adding these through the website if you can. Um, the reason being is that uh, you can add all of that information and in kind of right from the website. Um, you're not creating any duplicate customers, anything like that. Um, one of the things that you could run into is because it's working in an offline mode. Um, if you don't see the customer in this list and uh, you add a new customer, but you have a customer with the same name online, you will create a duplicate customer. Um, it just, it doesn't know um, what to do with those records. So it will just create a duplicate. Um, so best rule of thumb is if you don't see a customer in your drop down list, go and do a sync, make sure that it's really not there. And then you can either add it through the desktop or add it through the website. Underneath locations here, we have our ad atta uh, asset attachments. So these would be things like um, 
you know, uh, manufacturer information about the about the piece of equipment. Um, you could add a picture here if you wanted, if you'd taken a picture and loaded it through uh, an SD card or a flash drive. Um, you can add that asset attachment here. And then the last few fields on this screen, so you have a witness. So if this is somebody, uh, this would be a field for um, somebody else in your company that needs to witness the test or witness the operation that's being performed. Um, you can choose them from the drop down here. What they'll need to do afterwards is they will need to enter in their password um, so that as kind of an electronic signature that yes, they did witness that test. You can change the performed by. So if you're logged in as someone and you need to change it to somebody else, um, same thing, you can choose them from the drop down. They'll need to enter in their password, obviously, as just a security feature. We have your in-service date. So this is when this piece of equipment went into service and it was actively being used. Um, you can backdate this or clear this date if you don't need it. And then we have expiry date. So expiry date um, confuses some people. Um, this isn't when your certification or your inspection is going to expire on this piece of equipment. Expiry date I like to think of as uh, a jug of milk. So if you have a jug of milk and it's past its expiry date, you can't drink that jug of milk anymore because that has expired and it has curdled and, and it's just not good anymore. Um, that's what we use expiry date for. So if you have a, a hose or a piece of equipment that after five years or so uh, just cannot be used anymore, um, that's when you would set an expiry date. Um, you know, can't be used regardless if we recertify it or not. Um, it needs to be thrown out. So that's where you would set your expiry date. Other than that, you can just leave it blank. Once you've got all your information in here, the thing you're gonna do next is just go next to inspection. And that's gonna load your um, operation screen. So if we take a look up at the top there, because I've got um, uh, my periodic inspection and certification intervals defaulted through the website, um, these are automatically checked off for me. So on a single leg chain sling, I have a periodic inspection set for every six months. And then I have a periodic certification for every year. Um, you can, if you don't need the inspection, you can always just uncheck these boxes. Um, but what these do is they, these create the schedules on this piece of equipment um, that'll show up as green, yellow, and red on the website. So when your customer looks at that piece of equipment, if it's showing as green, it means it's still good to go. That certification is still active. Once it goes to yellow, that means that it's uh, going to be due within 30 days. And once it's gone red, that means that that is expired and you need to um, uh, get it recertified right away. The next two fields here are your operation attachments. So these are things specific to the operation. Uh, if you need to take a picture of the hose or the piece of equipment uh, that's being pull tested um, during the pull test, that's where you would add an operation attachment here. Um, you could take a picture and then just add it in on either one of these. And then once you're ready to go, the next thing you're going to do is click this launch test bench button. What that's going to do is that's going to connect with your um, transducer or your load cell um, that InfoChip support has configured to work with the program, uh, and it's going to start giving you your readings here. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to drop this off quick, get it as close as I can to zero, and we can kind of start on the side here. So if we look, I've got it set to working pressure in PSI right now, but um, what we would do is we would enter in what we want to test it to. So today I want to test my, my working load is going to be 500 pounds. Uh, and I'm going to test that to one and a half times my working load limit. My allowable overage is 2%, which is going to create my red line of a do not exceed point on my graph. Um, and then basically once I have that in there, I can kind of click in any of these fields. It's going to auto calculate everything for me. It's going to put it up at the top here, give me my do not exceed point. And then what I would do is once I'm ready to go, I just click start new test. So as you can see, the graph automatically starts populating here. And then what I would do is just manually increase the pressure, or increase the tension on that piece of equipment all the way up until I get to my target load. Right, as you can see, if I do exceed that red line, it's going to give me a notification right here that I've exceeded my maximum load. It means I just got to take the tension off just a little bit to get it in between those lines. And then it'll tell me that my target load has been met. So if we look on the 
uh, left hand side here, you'll see that it shows the time since the peak. Um, it's also recording the elapsed time of um, how long this test has been going for. And then once we've done our test, we can just drop that tension back off and hit stop. Uh, so one of the things I'll go over just super quickly um, is this en enhanced test bench module on the side here. Um, this is for uh, multiple cycling on um, uh, frac iron mainly. Um, it has been used for hose customers as well. Um, basically what it does is you would set your cycles where you would run multiple cycles on one test. Um, basically calculating where the peak is, what the allowable drop is after stabilization, and then the, the hold uh, the pressure at the end of the hold time. So you would set your hold time for three minutes per cycle. And then it just kind of gives you a, uh, an outline of uh, if it passes that cycle, if it fails, if it fails a cycle, it'll stop the test. Um, this is something if you if you do need to use it, um, definitely get a hold of your um, your salesperson and ask them uh, about their options for enhanced test bench. So once I have my chart here, I'm just going to hit save and close. And then, like I said before, um, because we selected the IC test bench proof test, it's going to automatically fill in our proof test type, our target load, what our peak load was, how long we held it there for, uh, and our test number. So our test number is going to be automatically generated from the test bench program, um, but we can highlight this and change it if you do have your own internal test numbers you need to put in there. So last couple of things here. So we're going to enter an order number. I'm just going to use uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, and then a PO number six, five, four, three, two, one. Um, these are really important. This will group together all of the tests that you're doing um, for a specific customer under an order number. Um, this really helps them um, keep their data nice and clean. If they're looking for a bunch of certs off of a, an order number, they're able to go onto the website uh, and just search by that order number and pull up all of their certs as opposed to uh, going one by one and having to search for each individual asset number. So really important feature up here. Last couple of fields on here. Um, so we have inspection instruction. So 99% of the time on all of your passes, it's just going to be NA, so not applicable. Nothing's going to happen to the asset. We also have repair and scrap. So if you set your asset to repair, it's going to take the asset out of service and it's no longer going to show up in your active asset screen. Um, in conjunction with repair, I like to use this generate alert option. Um, what that does is on the website, it'll create an alert on the dashboard saying you have an open operation or you have an op operation with an open alert. Basically what that does is they, uh, the person would click on that hyperlink, take a look at the operation itself. And then in the comment section, you would say what needs to be repaired. Um, so I would say bent hook needs to be replaced. The person's going to see that comment. They're going to take that piece of equipment and make the repair. Um, they're then going to close out that alert, add their own comment to the alert, and then move the asset back to active, which, where it can then be retested and recertified once that change has been made. And then the last option for inspection instruction is scrap. So this is, um, let's say you're testing a piece of wire rope and uh, it just bird cages on you, completely busts. Um, obviously, you're not going to use that piece of equipment again, so you would set it to scrap and fail. Uh, and that's going to take the asset out of the system, move it to scrapped. Um, you can search for scrapped assets. Um, it's just not going to show up in your active asset list. You need to specifically look for that status. But for today, we passed, so we're going to go not applicable. Certification results, so this is just the, the general certification result for the entire operation, if it's a pass or a fail. Um, we're not going to generate an alert here. Then the comments section, this is just any comments that you have about the uh, proof test itself. Um, you know, if there was anything that happened, anything the customer should be aware about, um, you know, uh, a standard that you were testing to, you could enter that into the comments. Last couple of things down here. Um, if you need to add notes to a selected task, um, so let's say if you need to add notes to a target load hold time, um, you can just kind of put your cursor into that field 
and then add notes to the selected task will open up a notes field underneath. This is just, you know, we held it here because of standard ABC123. Pass all tasks. So this is really important if you have a bunch of pass, uh, pass or fail type tasks on your operation. Basically what this does is by clicking that button, it'll set everything in your, uh, in your operation to a pass. So if you're doing a chain sling inspection, it makes it really, really fast. It just kind of fills everything in for you. And then current, set current section to NA would be, um, if you have a section header, uh, you're able to click on the section header and then click, um, set current section to not applicable and it'll take everything in that section if it has the task of na or the task field of na it will fill in all of those for you automatically so this one would be really good for um, crane inspections for example and then last two up at the top here so this is you can backdate the operation results um, so if you want to set the last certification date before this one to something else um, you can check this off and change that date as well and then once you're done everything the last thing you're going to do is click this generate cert button here what that does is that's going to generate your pdf for you if you take a look here, it's going to have all of your information. Uh, because we did an enhanced test, our graph's going to be on our second page here. Uh, it's going to have our hold time, but then you're going to have your cert and all ready to go. So the last thing you're going to do is just kind of take a look here. Uh, make sure all your information is correct. Print off the cert if you need a paper copy. And then you can close out this screen and hit save and upload. Um, what you can do as well, if you um, let's say you make a mistake in one of your asset characteristics and you need to go back and change that before you upload it what you can do is you can hit clear cert now you can go back make any changes so i see that my description wasn't changed so i'm just going to go and change that quick now i'm going to go back to my next to inspection i can generate my cert again and then i made that change up at the top here so all my information is correct again and then once I'm done, I can just hit save and upload. It's gonna prompt you to make sure that all of this information is correct before saving. We're just gonna hit yes. You'll see that it was saved successfully to the local machine. Now it's gonna try and upload down at the bottom here. It'll let you know verbally that your upload was complete. And then it's gonna try downloading any new items if there is any. And then it'll just kick you right back to the asset screen. So that's it. Um, if you're connected to the internet, it's gonna upload automatically. So all of that information, including your test chart PDF is going to be available on the website um, for your customer to access right away. So second thing we're gonna to cover today is creating multiple assets. So this will be fairly quick. Um, we're not gonna go through the entire process again because it is very similar to the single asset create process. The only thing that really changes is the top section of the asset create screen um, is going to have a table for us to enter multiple assets into. So we're gonna start uh, by just going web-1-1 and go create multiple assets. So our asset create screen is going to pop up again. We're going to see our asset number and serial number are filled out. But now we have this multi-asset list in the middle here. So what we can do is just click this add asset using above chip ID, asset number, and serial number. And it's going to add it to our list below. So now all we have to do is just keep changing that number, that visible asset number, and keep clicking the add asset using above. And we can create multiple identical assets in one single asset create as well as let's say we're testing um, we're testing a bunch of hoses at the same time off of the same transducer, um, we can do that in here as well, as long as they're all the same piece of equipment. So once we have our asset list in here, 
it's the same process as before. We're going to select our asset category, choose from a pre-fill to fill in our asset attributes, and continue along as we did before. Um, one of the nice things and a little kind of uh, hidden feature with this multi-asset list is if you create an Excel spreadsheet with these three columns in this order, so you have chip ID, asset number, and serial number, you can actually copy and paste all of your cells into this table and it'll create your list right off the bat. Uh, instead of going through and doing this one by one, you could just scan all your chip IDs, entering all your asset numbers, enter all your serial numbers, and then copy and paste that into this field if you like. Um, you know, you can, there's, there's no kind of limit on how many assets you can create in there. Um, obviously, if you're doing a, a thousand assets, I would highly recommend importing those assets as opposed to doing a bulk asset create, uh, just so that it doesn't maybe time out in the middle of uploading all of those assets. But you do have the option of that as well. So the last thing that we're going to go through today is recertifying an asset or performing an operation on an asset that already exists in the system. So I'm just going to cancel out of this screen and go back to my asset search screen. So what I'm going to do is let's say it's one year later and this web dash one asset has come back for a recertification. What I can do is I can search for that asset number or if I'm using RFID, I can scan the tag or key in the chip ID. Um, and pull up that information. So I'm going to enter my asset number and I'm going to hit search. So that pulls back that asset we just did the proof test on earlier. But we're going to say it's a year later and it needs to be recertified. So what I can do now is with, uh, with the asset selected, I go to the bottom left hand corner and click on asset. And then I'm going to click on perform operation. That's going to automatically load my operation list that is defaulted for this category. I'm going to choose my IC test bench proof test and then hit continue. From there, all it's going to do is just load my operation form uh, right away. I don't have to enter in any of that information again that I entered in last year. Um, that's all saved on the asset. All we have to do is go ahead and do our proof test. So we can click our launch test bench, start doing our proof test save and or generate our cert and save and upload. So it really, really speeds you up. Um, kind of the first year that you're, you're with InfoChip, you're going to be doing a lot of that data entry, a lot of that single asset crate. But as equipment is coming back to be recertified, uh, it really speeds up your process that you don't need to enter in that information again. You can just pull it up by the asset number or pull it up by the chip ID and be able to perform an operation right away. So I'm just going to cancel out of this now. Uh, I'm going to end the recording on here.